reactions in aqueous solution. By the end of this chapter, you will be able to identify compounds as acid or bases and as strong, weak, or non-electrolytes. You also will be able to recognize reactions by type and be able to predict the products of simple acid-base, precipitation, and redox reactions. You'll be able to calculate molarity and use it to convert between moles of a substance in solution and volume of the solution. You will describe how to carry out a dilution to achieve a desired solution concentration. And finally, you will describe how to perform and interpret the results of a titration. Let's talk first about solutions. Solutions are defined as homogeneous mixtures of two or more pure substances. The solvent is going to be present in the greatest abundance. All other substances will be the solutes. When water is the solvent, the solution is called an aqueous solution. Here we have an example of an aqueous solution of methanol. Methanol here is the solute of this solution, while water is the solvent. So this is a solution of methanol. And as you can see here, these are molecules that are separated by also molecules of water. They are not uh, close together because we have a lot of water that could um, surround those molecules of methanol. And this is an example of an aqueous solution because the solvent is water. So substances can dissolve in water by different ways. First, ionic compounds dissolve by dissociation where water surrounds the separate ions. Dissociation means that you can separate the ions. Remember that we are talking about ionic compounds. So ionic compounds are formed by ions. So when you are in water, if they separate, when you dissolve the salt, they separate, but also th those ions will separate by the water, and that's called also dissociation. Molecular compounds interact with water. In other words, they dissolve in water, but they will not dissociate, okay? So the ionic compounds will dissolve and also will dissociate it, but the molecular compound just will be dissolved. They will not be dis dissociated. Some molecular substances react with water when they dissolve. So these are the three ways that um, substances can dissolve in water. By ionic compounds, by dissolving and dissociation, molecular compound will dissolve and other molecular substances will react with water in a way to be dissolved in water. Here we have an example. This is a salt, a, a crystal structure of sodium chloride, and these are molecules of water, oxygen and hydrogen. And here, this is an ion of chloride ion, the green one, and this is a negative because remember that we are is, uh, chlorine is a nonmetal, so when it produces the ion chloride, it will produce an ion. And an ion has a negative charge. Also remember that water has bond between uh, has a bond between oxygen and hydrogen, and that bond is polar because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So the oxygen will pull away those electrons from hydrogen, making hydrogen partial positive. So that's why the interaction between this chloride and water is through hydrogen, because all those hydrogens are partial positive due to the presence of that polar bond between oxygen and hydrogen. As well, we can see here the ion of sodium. Sodium is positive, so it will interact with the negative part of the water, and that part is oxygen, the more, most electronegative um, atom between the, the uh, co covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen. So that's why the sodium here is surrounded by water, but by the oxygen part here, while the chloride here is surrounded by water, but interacting with the hydrogens. And here we have the methanol. Methanol is a molecular compound. It does not dissolve, okay? I mean, it's, not, it's, it dis, it's dissolved, but it's not dissociated. Here, this is the dissociation part, where they can separate the ions from the crystal structure. You have here the anion and here the cation. In the molecular, you just separate those molecules between them, but do not uh, produce ions. So this is just, a, is, is a dis, uh, you're dissolving just the methanol. Here you're doing the dissolving and also the dissociation. 
So now let's introduce the electrolytes and non-electrolytes. An electrolyte is a substance that dissociated into ions when dissolved in water, while a non-electrolyte may dissolve in water, but it does not dissociate into ions when it does so. Okay, so the electrolyte is a substance that could be dissociated in water that will be the uh, ionic compounds, while the non-electrolyte not non-electrolyte will uh, they can be dissociated in water. So those are basically the molecular compounds. So here, the ion, ionic compounds, all of them are strong electrolyte. None of them are weak electrolyte or non-electrolyte. While the molecular, the strong acid will be strong electrolytes. The weak acid and weak bases will be weak electrolyte. And all the other compounds would be non-electrolyte. So most of the co molecular compounds are non-electrolyte. If you have a strong acid, that will be a strong electrolyte. If you have a weak acid or base, that will be a weak electrolyte. And what that means or how, how we can identify those? Well, here we have water, pure water, H2O, non-ion in this water. This is basically distilled water. So that water does not conduct electricity. If we add, for example, glucose or sucrose, that's sugar, the sugar is a molecular compound. It can be dissociated. It can be it can dissolve, but not dissociated. So that's why this one does not conduct electricity neither, as well as pure water. But if we add sodium chloride to this water, those will be dissociated, creating those ions that will help to close the circuit so that bulb could be light. Okay, so that's why the sodium chloride is a strong electrolyte and it helps that in that um, to complete that circuit by uh, um, doing the relay of electrons so this bulb could be light. A strong electrolyte dissociated completely when dissolved in water. A weak electrolyte only dissociate partially when dissolved in water. A non-electrolyte non does not dissociate it in water, but it will be dissolved in water. As for example, here the glucose or the sucrose. It is this so, dissolved, but is not dissociated. Now let's talk about the solubility of ionic compound. Not all ionic compounds dissolve in water. Illicit solubility rules is used to decide what combination of ions will dissolve. And this is the table. Okay, so let's start by talking about this uh, soluble ionic compounds. Whenever you have nitrate, acetate, chloride, bromide, iodide, and sulfate, all this ionic compound with this anion will be soluble in water. Now, chloride, bromide, iodide, and sulfate, if they are uh, doing ionic compound with silver, mercury, and lead, at least these three, they will be insoluble. Those are exception, insolubles. If sulfate are doing um, compounds with any of these four cations, that compound will be also insoluble. Okay, but with other uh, the others uh, cation, this all of this will be always. This one solubles. For example, the nitrate and acetate always will be, will be soluble compounds in water. Insoluble ionic compounds will be the sulfide, the carbonate, the phosphate, and hydroxide. Any compounds with these anions will be insoluble, with some exceptions. If those compounds has ammonium or calcium, strontium, and barium, for example, this one, it will be soluble. Okay, so all of this, these are the exception for this anions that are most of the time are insoluble. If they're in for the combination of NH4 or the alkali metal cations, then they will be soluble. Well, if they are doing uh, an ionic compound with any other cations, they will be insoluble. So that's those are the rules, uh, the basic rules of solubility. So we can identify which ionic compound will be dissolved or not in water. And remember that if it is soft in water, it will be dissociated and will be a strong electrolyte. So let's talk about precipitation reactions. 
When two solutions containing soluble salts are mixed, sometimes an insoluble salt will be produced. A salt falls out of solution like snow out of the sky. This solid is called a precipitate. And here we're going to show you an example. Here we have a solution, in this case of potassium iodide, and here we have uh, lead nitrate. Okay, so these are two homogeneous solutions. Okay, they are not solid over there in, in either of those uh, solutions. And when we start to mix those solutions, you, you can see this yellow precipitate that is still is forming while you're adding the potassium iodide. And when you finish to add all the solution, you will have all the precipitate in the bottom of the beaker. And in solution, you will have other ions, the ones that are not uh, insoluble or precipitate. So in this case, this solid is the lead iodide. These are lead iodide. And in solution, you will still have potassium nitrate in this uh, dissociated. Okay, so you'll have ions of potassium and ions, ions of nitrate because the nitrates are soluble, okay? And the iodide, most of them are soluble with the exception of lead and the other uh, cations that we mentioned in the table before. And this is a precipitation reaction. So if you have these two reactants, you can switch, okay? We're gonna see that in the next uh, slides. We are switching this cation with this anion and this cation with this anion. And then we evaluate using the table, the rules, to see if those possible products are soluble or insoluble. So this type of reaction is known as metath metathesis or exchange reactions. Metathesis comes from the Greek word that means to transpose. It appears as though the ions in the reactant compounds exchange or transpose ions as seen in the equation below. Here we have the silver nitrate and the potassium chloride and we are going to produce potassium, I mean, silver chloride and potassium nitrate. Um, this is the cation, so we can combine this cation with this anion and this cation with this anion. It is important that you can identify those reactants as aqueous. Remember, when they are aqueous, that means that these are soluble. So these compounds are dissociated. And I know that they are dissociated because they both are ionic compounds. Okay, both of them are ionic compounds, and it says here in the equation that they, they are aqueous, so that means that this nitrate, uh, silver nitrate, and the potassium chloride, both of them are in solution. Both of them are dissociated. But when we mix this with this solution, then a solid will be produced that is known as the silver chloride plus potassium nitrate. So this one is a solid, okay, and we can look for the exceptions in table one the, for the chloride, that's when you combine chloride with silver, this will be insoluble in water. So that's why you have an S as a solid and you will have potassium nitrate. So that means that when all this react, you will have this as solid and this in solution dissociated. You will have ions of potassium and ions of nitrate. You would not see ions of silver and chloride at this point. Here, yes, they are in two separate beakers. We have one beaker with the silver uh, nitrate and one beaker with the potassium chloride. So here we will see the silver ions, and here we will see silver, I mean, uh, chloride ions. But here, when they react, you the only ions that you will see is, is going to be the potassium and the nitrate because this combined to produce the silver chloride that is a solid that will be insoluble in water. So completing and balancing metathesis equations. These are you need to follow the, the, the next steps. First, use the chemical formulas of the reactants to determine which ions are present. Write formulas for the products, cation from one reactant and ion from the other. Use charges to write the proper subscript. And check your solubility rules if either product is insoluble, a precipitate will form. And finally, balance the equation. So we have uh, uh, three different ways to write metathesis reaction. First of all, the molecular equation. Then we're going to write the complete ionic equation. And finally, 
we'll write the net ionic equation. The molecular equation is when we combine the, the two initial reactants and we write the possible, the expected products. The complete ionic equation is when we represent this molecular equation but in ions, we separate those that can be dissociated. And finally, the net equa ionic equations are the ones, the equation that really explain the reaction that is being produced in that uh, beaker or that reaction. So, for example, let's see this. The molecular equation lists the reactions and products without indicating the ionic nature of the compounds. Something like this. You, can, you will see just the uh, molecules or the compounds. In this case, they are ionic compounds. Remember, this one is aqueous and this one is aqueous. So that means that we have this one as ions dissociated. And this one can't be dissociated because it's a solid. It's insoluble in water. And this one will be dissociated. So that's important to write the next equation that is the complete ionic equation. Here, in the complete ionic equation, all strong electrolyte, the strong acid, the strong bases, and soluble ionic salts are dissociated into their ions. So we just separate them. Okay, so we have the silver nitrate, we separate the silver from the nitrate and we just use the same charge, uh, silver is plus one, nitrate minus one. We, re we write the uh, subscript of the state of that ion that is aqueous. The potassium chloride, we just also uh, dissociate uh, this and we create the ions, potassium and chloride. And this will produce the silver chloride. We did not dissociate this one because it's insoluble in water, so we keep it this way. While the silver nitrate, I mean the potassium nitrate, is soluble in water, so we dissociate this one again, and we have the potassium and the nitrate um, ions separate. Okay, so the complete ionic equation, we write all the ions possible in the reactant and its product, and also we keep the ones that are insoluble as solid. We don't separate, we don't dissociate that one because it's insoluble in water. And finally, we will write the net ionic equation. To form the net ionic equation, cross out anything that does not change from the left side of the equation to the right, or something that is repeating both sides. If we have something that is the same ion in the reactants and in the product, we will need to remove those. The ions crossed out are called the spectator ions, and in this case, the potassium and the nitrate are an uh, example of those. The remaining ions are the reactants that forms the product and insoluble salt in a precipitation reaction, as we can see in this example. So that means that we have silver here. We don't have the ion of silver in the reactants, in the products. We have the nitrate here, and we have nitrate in, in reactants and products, so we need to cancel this one. Potassium, we have potassium ion here, potassium ion here, so we, so we need to cancel those. The chloride ion here in the product is part of the solid, so we don't have an ion of chloride in the product, so we can't cancel the chloride, neither the, the silver. So we just draw a line on top of those spectator ions. So these are spectator ions. And we just write the net ionic equation. That will be the silver plus the chloride in solution will produce the silver chloride solid, the precipitate. And this, are, this is how we write those kind of precipitation reaction. So, write a net ionic equation, write a balanced molecular equation, dissociate all strong electrolytes, cross out anything that remains unchanged from the left side to the right side of the equation, and write the equ net ionic equation with the species that remains. That's how we write the net ionic equation, starting from the molecular, then to the complete ionic equation, and finally the net ionic equations. So let's talk now about acids. There are two definitions of acid. One of them was uh, developed by uh, a chemist known as Arrhenius. He defined acids as the substances that increase the concentration of protons, or H positive, or hydrogen ion, when dissolved in water. So when, you f when, when he found an acid, that uh, a, a compound that increased the concentration of protons, or hydrogen ions, in water, that he defined that as an acid. While Bronsted and Lori also, they defined acid as the proton donor. Okay, so Bronsted, Lowry defined an acid as a proton donor, while Arrhenius 
refine an acid as the substance that increases the concentration of protons in the water. Here we have some example of acids, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and acetic acid. Most of the time, it's very common to see um, compounds with protons at the beginning, and those are acid. So this one, acetic acid, is one of the ex ex exception because this is a carboxylic acid, and the proton usually is written uh, before those two oxygens. But most of the time, the acid has those hydrogens at the beginning of the chemical formula. The basis, Arrhenius defined basis as substances that increase the concentration of hydroxide ions or OH when dissolved in water. Okay, those are bases. And Bronsted Lowry defined them as proton acceptors. So acid for Bronsted Lowry, Lowry are proton donor and bases are proton acceptor. While for Arrhenius, the acid are the ones that increase the concentration of protons and the bases are the ones that increase the concentration of hydroxide in solution. Also, we can identify a liquid as an acid or as a base using a litmus paper. This one turns the litmus paper in blue as a base. The ones that turns the litmus paper in red is an acid. Okay, so that's another way to identify uh, a solution as an acid or a base. Now, we have strong and weak acid and base. Strong acids completely dissociated in water. Weak acid only partially dissociated. So strong acid will be dissociated 100%. So for example, we have hydrochloric acid, HCl. That means when you add HCl to water, you will completely dissociate H from chloride. You will never see HCl in water. You will see hydrogens and chloride as ions. It's completely dissociated. So that means that it's going to be a strong electrolyte, okay? So because it's dissociated completely. And we have weak acids that they dissociate really, really small quantities. Most of the time, maybe like from 1% to 10% of the, of, of the concentration will be dissociated. So that's why they are weak acids. Strong bases dissociated to metal cations and hydroxide ions in water. And weak bases only partially react to produce hydroxides and anions. So also the strong bases will completely dissociate it, okay? So, and as well, for example, sodium hydroxide is one of them, strong bases here. When you add that to water, you will separate those ions. You will induce a dissociation because these are ions. And the sodium will be surrounded by water, specifically with the oxygen that will interact with sodium. Sodium is a cation. And oxygen is the negative part of the molecule of water, while hydroxide uh, will then uh, interact with the protons okay, of water, with H, with the hydrogens. So we have also acid and base reaction. In this case, we have here a compound that is receiving one hydrogen from water. Here, water is acting as an acid and ammonium is acting as a base. And as a product, when you remove this hydrogen from water, you will have OH before you have H2O. You remove one hydrogen, that hydrogen is positive, so that means that you will keep here a uh, uh, result, a negative charge, so we have an OH hydroxide, while ammonium that here is neutral, it doesn't have a charge, but it receives one hydrogen that is a positive uh, species, positive ion, so it will produce NH4 positive. So this is an acid acid base reaction. In an acid base reaction, the acid that here is the water will donate a proton to the base that is the ammonium. Reaction between an acid and a base are called neutralization. When the bases of metal hydroxide, water, and salt are produced. When a strong acid like HCl, hydrochloric acid, reacts with a strong base as sodium hydroxide, the net equation is going to be something like this. Here we have the molecular, uh, the molecular equation, hydrochloric acid, sodium hydroxide, producing sodium chloride and water. 
Here, remember, these are strong, strong acid and strong base, so they will be completely dissociated. So this cation will react with this anion, and this cation will react with this anion. So H plus OH, that will be water, while sodium and chloride will be sodium chloride. So this, all of three, will be dissociated in water, while water will be liquid, okay, one of the products. So when we write here the net ionic equation, I mean the complete ionic equation, we're going to have all this dissociated and also, as well as this one with the exception of water that is a liquid. A liquid is pure, this is pure one. So this one, H2O, is not ionic compound. So you can dissociate um, water. So that means that now we need to cancel all the ones that you repeat in the products and then react and that they repeat. So we have here chloride, chloride, sodium, sodium. We need to cancel those um, ions and the result net ionic equation will be H plus OH that will be water. This is known as a neutralization reaction because we are going to produce water and water, the pH of water is 7. That is known as a neutral pH. So that's why it's called a neutralization reaction. We're going to produce water and salt. And most of the time when you're doing a neutralization, the two possible products will be a soluble salt and water for a neutralization reaction between a strong acid and a strong base. Also, there is another type of reaction known as a gas forming reaction. In this one, some metathesis re reactions did not give the product expected. When a carbonate or bicarbonate reacts with an acid, the products are a salt, carbon dioxide, and water. So here we have calcium carbonate and HCl, and this will produce the calcium chloride plus CO2 and water. The CO2, as you can see here, is a gas. Also, the sodium bicarbonate with um, HBr will produce the sodium bromide and the carbon dioxide and water, once again, the production of gas. So here, if you see uh, the carbonate ions or the bicarbonate, that will give you a hint that one of the product will be carbon dioxide, okay, the gas compound. Now, this reaction gives a predicted product, but you had better carry out in the hood. The gas produced has a fall other, okay. The H2S here is has a really, really strong and, and, and bad other. So here you have the sodium sulfide with the uh, sulfuric acid will produce the sodium sulfate and H2S. The other type of reaction is known as oxidation reduction reaction. Here we see we have a metal. Here is calcium. And when that calcium reacts with oxygen, it will produce the calcium oxide. The oxidation is when you lose electrons, while the reduction is when you gain electron. Here, if you if we can see here the, the ionic compound, here we have an ionic compound, the calcium is from family 2. So that means that this ion is plus 2, while this ion is minus 2, oxygen. At this point, the calcium was 0. It has a charge, an uh, uh, um, um, oxidation number of 0 because it's in its natural state as a solid, as calcium. This one is zero. But when it turns to the calcium oxide, it turns to plus two. So calcium lose two electrons. So that's why calcium was oxidized. While oxygen here, the um, because it's also in a natural state, oxygen, the oxidation number is zero for oxygen, but here it turns to minus two. So that means that the oxygen gained two electrons, went from zero to minus two, so oxygen experienced the reduction. So calcium experienced the oxidation, releasing those electrons here, while the oxygen will receive those electrons to produce then the calcium oxide. So the loss of electrons is oxidation, the gain of electrons is the reduction, and both of them needs to happen at the same time. You can have one oxidation occurring without a reduction. If something is, is experienced reduction, there has to be someone that is releasing those electrons, okay, and this being oxidized.
So while calcium is releasing electrons, oxygen is receiving those electrons. Calcium has been oxidized, while ox oxygen will be reduced, was, was reduced. The reactions are often called the redox reaction, reduction, and oxidation. Re red reduction, ox oxidation. So let's talk about the oxidation numbers. To determine if an oxidation reduction reaction has occurred, we assign an oxidation number to each element in a neutral compound or charged entity. Rules to assign oxidation numbers. First, elements in their elemental form have an oxidation number of zero, as the one that we saw before, the calcium as a solid is in the elemental form, as well as the oxygen, O2, that's the elemental form of oxygen. So for both of them, the oxidation number was zero. The oxidation number of a monatomic ion is the same as its charge. So if we are talking about, for example, lithium, lithium is from family one, is plus one, so that's, that's uh, charge, is also the oxidation number. If we're talking about fluoride, that is minus one, family seven, that uh, uh, charge is also the oxidation number. Nonmetals tends to have negative oxidation number, although some are positive in certain compounds or ions. But most of the time, the nonmetals are negative. Oxygen has an oxidation number of minus 2, except in the peroxide ion, in which it has an oxidation number of minus 1. So oxygens could have different numbers, oxidation numbers. As well as hydrogen. Hydrogen will be minus 1 when bonded to a metal. But most of the time, it's going to be plus one when it will be when it's bonded to a non-metal. So fluorine always has an oxidation number of minus one. It's in family seven halogens. But the other halogens have an oxidation number of minus one when they are negative. They can have positive oxidation numbers, most notably in oxy anions. Most of the time, they're going to be minus one with the exception when they are part of oxygen ions, but they will have positive oxidation numbers. So the sum of the oxidation numbers in a neutral compound is zero. Okay, as we saw before with the calcium oxide, calcium, ox calcium is plus two, oxygen minus two. When you add both number, it's gonna be zero because calcium oxide is a neutral compound. But when the sum of the oxidation number in polyatomic ion is the uh, we have also sometimes that in polyatomic ions, it has a charge and it's going to be equal to the sum of the oxidation number of the ions. So in that case, uh, when we have polyatomic ions, the sum of the um, atoms involved in that polyatomic ions is going to be equal to the charge of the polyatomic ion. There are also another type of reaction known as displacement reaction. In displacement reaction, ions oxidize an element. In this reaction, silver ions oxidize copper metal. So here we have the silver, and the silver, as we can see here, turns from silver ion to silver solid. So this one is in the elemental uh, uh, state. So that's why this one is zero. So it went from plus one to zero. Silver was the reduction, while copper went from 0 to plus 2, so copper is the oxidation. So we have that's half reaction, that is the oxidation of copper, and the half reaction of uh, oxidation, that is from silver. So copper experienced the uh, oxidation, while silver the reduction, plus 1 to 0, 0 to plus 2. The silver ions oxidize the copper metal. Okay, they induce the, the copper to oxidize, or the copper induce the silver to get reduced. Here we see the that reaction. We have silver nitrate in solution, and there's a copper copper wire wire in the solution, and suddenly that it starts to react, and the silver ion start to oxidize the co the copper, turning copper solid to copper in solution. And here, the blue solution is due to the presence of ions of copper. Okay, and while in the wire, you're going to see a solid as a silver that is basically 
uh, that silver solid that comes from the solution from a positive ion to a solid, as we can see here, the ion of silver to the solid, and it's it will um, deposit on top of the wire, copper wire. So the reverse reaction does not occur. Why not? So silver may induce copper to oxidize, okay, but copper can make silver to oxidize, okay, so it, it can do the reverse reaction. Why not? Because each, react, each uh, metal will react in a different way through oxidation reaction. In this table, as higher you are in, the, in this list, you are more reactive to the oxidation reaction. So that means that here we have copper and silver, so copper will be more reactive as an oxidation, so that's why silver will induce the reduction. So that's what we can see here. Silver went from plus one to zero is the reduction, and copper will be oxidized. So that's why this reaction goes through this side instead of the reverse reaction, because of the reverse reaction, uh, the silver is not that reactive, okay, to experience that oxidation as well as the copper. As we can see here, the copper is more reactive as an, ox an oxidation reaction than the silver. So it prefers copper to be oxidized while the silver to be redu uh, uh, reduced. So here we have the lithium. Lithium has the higher reactivity as an oxidation. So that means that whatever metals are going to react against uh, lithium, all of those metals are going to be reduced. The ion is going to be reduced to the metal because lithium is the more reactive in oxidation reaction. So elements higher on activity series are more reactive for the oxidation reaction, and they are more likely to exist as ion. Okay, so that's why basically here it goes from zero to plus one, so they will exist better as an ion than as a solid. Another kind of reaction is the metal acid displacement reaction. The element above hydrogen will react with acid to produce hydrogen gas. The metal is oxidized to a cation. So here we have that react kind of reaction. We have here the hydrochloric acid plus the magnesium. And when this react, it will produce, here we have the magnesium as a solid. Here is the um, uh, acid, strong acid. That was the word strong that I was looking for. A strong acid that is a hydrochloric acid. And when they both react, they you can see here they start to produce some kind of bubbles a gas, okay, that represent uh, is, is is seen as bubbles, and that bubbles is the production of hydrogen gas, and in solution we're going to have the magnesium chloride, okay, as a, as as part of the ions of the solution, aqueous solution, so that those bubbles are hydrogen. So here we can see that hydrogen went from plus one because it's family one, and chlorine is minus one, so went from plus one to zero. This is the elemental state of hydrogen. So went from plus one to zero, that's a reduction. So that means the magnesium was oxidized. And when we see them, the, the oxidation number of magnesium here is zero, is in elemental state. Okay, magnesium is zero. And here is plus two because we have two chlorines that each one is minus one. So that's why magnesium is plus two. So plus two from zero plus two plus two, the magnesium experienced the oxidation. Okay, while well, hydrogen experienced the reduction Magnesium experience the oxidation. So here we have plus one to zero reduction, zero to plus two oxidation. And chlorine stay, chloride stayed as minus one. There is no change in the oxidation number of the chloride. So let's talk now about concentration. We have been talking about solutions and about a different kind of compounds that create those solutions. Uh, what about the concentration of a solid in the solution? There is one uh, unit of concentration that is known as molarity. The quantity of solid in a solution can matter to a chemist. We call the amount dissolved its concentration. And molarity is one way to measure the concentration of a solution. The molarity we're gonna, is going to be represented with a capital M. is going to be equal to the moles of the solid divided by the volume of the solution, not just of the, of the um, solvent, is the volume of the solution, of the complete solution with solvent and all the solids that you have in solution, okay? So the molarity, capital M, equals to moles divided by the volume, moles of solid, volumes of solution. 
this is an equation of three different variables. So that means that if we have the molarity and we have the volume, we can calculate the moles. If we have the moles and we have the volume, we can calculate molarity. If, I have mo if we have moles and we have molarity, we can calculate the volume of the solution that we need to create. So remember that this equation is not just to calculate molarity. You can calculate the most moles of solute that you need to add to create a, 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 a solution of specific molarity with a specific volume, or you can determine the volume that you will need eventually to create a solution of, uh, of any kind of molarity with a specific number of moles. Okay, So remember that this equation will help to determine any of these three uh, amounts or quantities. So how we, we create a solution? So to create a solution of a known molarity, we need to weight out a known mass, and therefore the number of moles of the solid. So we need to, do, we need to calculate how much of the solid we need, and we then go weight out that amount, and we add that to a volumetric flask of a specific volume, the one that we determine uh, we use in the molarity here, we have a specific volume. So if we use, for example, 250 mils, we need to use a volumetric uh, flask of 250 milliliters. We here we weight 39.9 uh, grams okay, of so, uh, copper sulfate, for example, and we want to create this solution. That solution is about 250 mils. So we add first the solid in the volumetric uh, flask, and then we add a little bit of water in a way that we can dissolve that solid. Once the solid is dissolved, then we complete until the mark, it reached the coloration mark on the neck of the flask. Okay, so we just weight first the solid, the amount of follows that we calculate um, to create this solution. In this case, it's 39.9 grams of copper sulfate. We add it to the volumetric flask. We add a little bit of water uh, or enough water to dissolve all this, this, the solid. And once everything is, is dissolved, then we complete until the mark that usually is in the neck <clears throat> to create a solution of 250 mils with that specific uh, concentration. Also, we can create a diluted solution from a concentrated solution <clears throat> by using, for, uh, for example, a pipette. To deliver a specific volume of that solution to a new volumetric flask and then completes with water okay or, or the solvent that we're going to use in this case is basically water with uh, using aqueous solution so here we have this stuck solution that we prepared before that was one uh, molar this concentration was one molar and we're going to take a sample of 25 mils and add it to this new volumetric flask of 250 okay as you can see here we are adding 25 mils of this solution, stuck solution, to this new volumetric flask. And once we deliver the whole um, sample, then we complete with water until it reach the uh, calibration mark on the neck of the flask. And here we have a solution of 0.1 molar. Okay, this is a dilution from the stuck solution that was 1.0 molar. So the molarity of the new solution can be determined from the equation mc plus times uh, molarity of the concentrated times the volume of the concentrated equal to the uh, molarity of the diluted plus the volume of the diluted. Or also, we can, instead of concentrated, we can use initial. So we can set the molar initial molar molarity times the initial volume equals to the final molarity times the final volume, both of them that are correct so you can use whatever you want uh, you feel more comfortable to use so M both of them are the molarity of the concentrated and the dilution or the initial or final uh, uh, solutions and the volumes that in this case is the volume that we need from the concentrated solution and this is the volume at the end for the final solution okay so this is the volume of the sample for the initial solution and this is the final volume that we gonna we need to create this concentration. Okay, so this is a sample volume, and this is the final volume for the final concentration, uh, final solution. 
So using molarity, we can also uh, work with the stoichiometric calculation. If we have, for example, substance B and substance A, we are have a molarity of substance B, and we, we want to determine the constant of the grams of substance A, we can go from molarity to mass of substance B by using the volume. If we have molarity and volume, we can calculate the mass of substance B. And to change from mass of substance B to mass of substance A, we need to look for the equation that relates both compounds and look for the coefficients. And in that way, we can turn from mass to B to mass to A and eventually turn this mass to A to mass of substance by using the molar mass of A. Okay, at the same way, if we have grams, the mass of A, we can turn that mass of A to mass of A and by using the molar mass. And then once we have the mass of A, we can turn to mass of B using the coefficient for imbalance equation. And at this point, if we need to calculate the molarity, we can use the volume. So moles divided by volume is going to be the molarity. If we need to calculate the volume, we have the moles. So we need to multiply moles times molarity, and that will be equals uh, actually, it will be moles divided by molarity will be equals to the volume, okay? So in that way, we can calculate the volume of the substance B. So we can do this is like a, 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 a big picture, okay, of all the possibilities that we can have from substance B to substance A by using the molarity uh, of the concentration of the solution, okay, to look for the grams of the substance, other, another substance in the reaction. Titration is one of the techniques that maybe we can use that map that we saw in the slide before. And that titration is an analytical technique in which one can calculate the concentration of a solid in a solution. So here we have, for example, a sample of acid. The concentration of this acid, we don't know the concentration, it's a known concentration. And we have a tw the sample is 20 mils, okay, 20 mils of the acid. We're going to add a few drops of an acid beta indicator. Most of the time it's known as phenophthalene, this one. And when phenophthalene is in acid, it's clear. It's, it doesn't have color, okay? So the phenophthalene in acid is uh, it has is, is clear. Now, once we're going to have a beer here with a standard solution of sodium hydroxide. We know the concentration of the sodium hydroxide, the base that we're going to use to do the titration of this solution. And we're going to start to add this solution, okay, until we reach the this pinkish color. This one is a little bit strong. It has to be more clear than that. <clears throat> but at this point, we have used, we have, um, we react all the hydrogens from the acid with the base. Okay, so basically, the volume that we use here, we can calculate that volume multiplied by the concentration of this sodium hydroxide, and we're going to calculate the moles of that base. And if the reaction is one-to-one, -one, that means that if we have, for example, we use 30 moles we heat of base, those react with the 30 moles of the hydrogen of the acid, and by that, using the volume, we can calculate the concentration of the acid. Okay, so we use basically the citration where we have a sample of an unknown concentration of the acid. The only data that we know about the acid is the, um, is the uh, volume that we add that was 20 mils. Okay, we add the indicator and then we're going to start to use the uh, titration agent that in this case is going to be a base because this is going to be an acid-base reaction to titrate all of the hydrogens that we have in solution. And this one is sodium hydroxide, so the OH is going to react with the hydrogen, okay, until th there are no more H, because if there were still H, the solution were clear, because in phenophthalene, this indicator will be clear when in the presence of protons. So that means that when it turns pink, all the protons were consumed, all the protons we add with the base that we add. And because we know the concentration, of that base because it's a standard uh, sodium hydroxide and we know the volume of that base we can multiply the volume with the concentration and that will be the number of moles of the base and if the reaction is one to one with the coefficients that means that that amount of moles of base are equal to the amounts of hydrogens 
So those moles of hydrogen divided by the initial volume, that is 20, because the sample was 20 mils, then we can calculate there the concentration of the acid. So basically here we have that map where we have the volume of the standard solution that was needed to reach the equivalence point. That equivalence point is where uh, all the, the, the sample was consumed by the titration agent that in this case was the sodium hydroxide. So we, we have that volume. We use the molarity, so volume times molarity was going to be equal to the moles of the standard solution. By using the coefficients, we can turn those moles of the standard solution to moles of the unknown solution. And once that we have the moles, we divide it by the volume that, of the sample that we add to do the titration, and this will give us the concentration of the unknown solution. The reaction is complete at the equivalence point. At that point is when it turns from clear to pink because we don't have any more protons in the solution. That's why it turns pink. And this will be the, uh, the end of Chapter 4, Reactions in Aqueous Solutions.